All right. Uh, if you'd like to stay in the attendees, that's absolutely okay as well. You won't be, um, you will not be recorded in the recording. Uh, and we can still allow you to, to speak as well if you are in the um, attendees. All right, we're gonna give it a minute or so, Bob, if that sounds good to you. Yep. Um, so, and I'm gonna just keep repeating what I said before, which is that if you are in the attendees, if you're joining us for a District 5 meeting, and you'd like to be in the room with us, you can go ahead and raise your hand on Zoom and I will bring you into the room so you can we can see you and all of that good stuff. Uh, otherwise you can stay in the attendees as well. All right, Andy, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, you're muted. Thanks for inviting me and uh... Uh, delighted to be is as many uh, district meetings as I can because uh, I have to be aware of what's going on everywhere as a member at large. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, all right. So let's see. It is 302. Oh my God, 302. 602. Sorry. I, I know what time it is. I, I promise. <laughs> I don't know what time zone you were on, but. I know, I, I no, I, South Amherst time zones, yeah, as everyone knows, we're uh, three hours behind. Um, all right. You in California. Yeah. That's right. Sadly, actually, no, happily I'm here. All right, everybody, why don't we, we're going to go ahead and get this started. Um, for those who are in the attendees, I'll repeat this a couple more times, but if you'd like to be brought into the Zoom room, you can go ahead and raise your hand on Zoom and we can bring you in. Well, it'll say promote to panelist and we'll bring you in so that you can turn your camera on if you want. Um, and for those who are staying in the attendees, if you'd like to speak at any point, you can raise your, your Zoom hand uh, and I can either allow you to talk or uh, bring you into the room. So I will try promote to panelist first. And if you decline it, I will allow you to talk. Um, all right. And then what happens is when I say promote to panelist, it sends you a little link or a little, not a link, uh, a button that you have to click accept. So Andrea, I just sent you that um, invite. Bob, do you want to, uh, do you have any inspiring notes to start us off or anything to add? Otherwise, I'm happy to welcome folks here on this lovely well, October. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I'm glad that you were taking the time to join us and uh, we really want to hear what you have to say. Um, it's very rare that we get the opportunity to talk to residents, um, especially in a, in a structured way. And so uh, we're looking forward to uh, this, this evening. Go ahead, Anna. All right, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Anna, for those I haven't met yet. Uh, and we are, uh, this is our first District 5 meeting for this year. We will have one other one as well uh, in this calendar year. Uh, Bob and I are your two District 5 representatives. Uh, and we're also joined by Andy Steinberg, who's a counselor at large, and Lynn Griesmer, who's president of the council. I'm going to say my note one more time for folks who are in the attendees, um, because we uh, run town meetings like this as webinar styles in Zoom. You will need to raise your hand to be brought into the Zoom room uh, with us if you'd like to be uh, on the screen. That does mean you'll be part of the recording, but you can go ahead and raise your hand uh, if you're in the attendees room and you'd like to raise your Zoom hand. I can't see your real hand. Um, raise your Zoom hand if you'd like to be brought into the room with us. And this is again to avoid Zoom bombings. Um, and I shared before having been on the receiving end of those they're very unpleasant so we're taking that measure so right now nobody in the attendees room we have 11 folks in the attendees um and no one's hand is up to be brought into the room so uh, i'm assuming those folks would like to stay not on camera which is fine and we will go ahead and and start off um okay so let's see sorry i'm pulling up the agenda Bob, do we have Andy up first or we have? Yeah, Andy's up first. <clears throat> All right. So Andy, I'm going to turn it over to you and um, we will go ahead and, and hear an update on waste hauler, the waste hauler bylaw. Is that right? That's what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, I th think we need to start a little, just a little bit. We didn't, I don't think you have the, uh, uh, 
PowerPoint that was available. So mm -hmm. we'll just go and go I, I have that, Andy, if, if you'd like me to share my screen. Yeah, we can bring that up. It's up to you. Um, it's up to you. Whatever let's you do it. I think it's helpful. Um, and yeah, I think it's helpful. Um, and uh, But in any event, what it starts with is sort of an explanation of why we started down the path of considering the change. This is a process that's going to be in play for a little while, and I want to give you a sense of that because we will want to hear from you often as we uh, get towards making a decision. But it's... Uh, you know, starting out now with just sort of an understanding of why we're having the discussion and uh, why the council uh, has taken a step of asking the town manager to issue a request for proposals for um, haulers who provide the uh, provide uh, trash uh, pickup service at home. And uh, which is what, because the change would be from the current system, which is having um, individuals contract directly with a hauler who has applied to provide service within the town. But the, in, the arrangement is entirely, once um, somebody signs up, is entirely with the hauler um, or the alternative method is to have the town um, take over the role of being the provider and having a contract with the hauler so that the direct contact, uh, direct contract with the uh, homeowners is uh, through the town. And uh, the reasons we are talking about doing this is uh, several. One is that, um, and I think, uh, you know, this, probably for me, uh, the primary one that started this is um, some environmental reasons. Um, and one of them is that uh, our landfills are filling up. We are shipping uh, trash at a much greater distance. We really uh, need to try and reduce trash um, is an environmental reason as, and an economic reason. And uh, for that, um, and, and there are several other things to know. One is, of course, that when you ship it out of uh, the area, not only is there the cost, but there's an environmental impact of doing that because you're burning fossil fuel to ship trash to be- oh, Andy, I'm gonna, oh, sorry, I'm pause. Bob, did you want to bring that up or would you like me? I, I do have the presentation. Okay, I tried to bring it up. I, for, for some reason, I'm not able to do that. Okay, um, Andy, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just, I realized it wasn't up yet and I want to um, get it up for you in one one moment. You can keep going. I'm, I'm, I have it uh, downloading now. Okay. Um, and I think that we'll, if it's a slide program that I think that it is, it should show up fairly quickly to the area that I'm describing. And uh, the, um, in addition to the uh, cost of the environmental impact of having tra uh, the trash shipped and the gasoline or fossil fuels that are burned to do that, um, there's another thing that we're concerned about, and that is that uh, once you bury trash, if it has um, compostable material, um, in it, it um, leaks methane gas into the environment, and uh, that is a greenhouse gas. And um, our climate action goals are to reduce greenhouse gas, not to not. And this is one method of doing it: is if we can also build uh, compost into the system and uh, encourage uh, homeowners uh, to uh, separate compost and allow it to be shipped to an appropriate facility, which is close by, 
the nearest one that uh, does this kind of work is actually, I think, up in Greenfield. And uh, it is a uh, place that uh, has the capacity of uh, uh, continually stirring the trash and not having methane come because it is not just being buried. Um, when you do compost um, in your backyard, you may be leaking some methane. And I uh, will note that the uh, expert is somebody who I see in the audience, and uh, that's Darcy DeMond, former counselor, uh, because Darcy, Darcy has been working on these issues for a number of years, too. Um, I got involved, actually, back in the days when I was on the select board, when we still had a select board, and I was uh, the select board liaison to um, the town committee that was developing a waste hauler uh, plan. And that's what we're, for the most part, what we're trying to do is follow through with that plan and implement the um, key parts of it. So the last part of, that's on your screen right now is the one in the middle, which is pay as you throw. And the idea of pay as you throw is quite simple, that uh, if those of us who uh, buy water know that uh, when you buy water, you're buying by the volume, the more water you use, the more you pay. Uh, and uh, that encourages us to not be wasteful of something we're going to have to pay for more if we use more. Uh, we don't do that for volume of trash and pays you throw uh, is really a uh, way of, uh, um, and I'll come to back to the words in a second, but uh, it, it's, it's a way of encouraging um, the reduction in the amount of trash and the use of compost instead and just being more conscious of what you're uh, disposing of, because if you have less trash, it will enable you to pay less. And uh, it's called pays you throw because the original pays you throw system involved people buying plastic bags and the more plastic bags you have, uh, the um, more you're paying because you buy it's by the plastic bag. Uh, those of you who use the transfer station know that you pay $3 for each bag that you uh, use, and uh, that is a pay-as-you-throw system. Um, now, because of uh, changes in technology, most haulers will don't want to um, regularly be picking up trash bags because it's uh, more time-consuming and affects the health and safety of their employees. And they much prefer the bin system, which we're all used to now from watching US a chart hauling and how they do it. So um, the, you would uh, try and charge um, proportionately or charge less for a smaller bin. So that is basically it, what you see right now on the screen and I'm not right. gonna read it all because I want to go faster from the, for a little bit. Uh, but uh, the um, this describes the current system, part of which I've described already, and uh, the uh, which got to the question of the town council motion. The idea of the motion is is that we don't really know what is possible and what it will cost until we get um, proposals from haulers, from um, the experience of other towns, it, it does work. It does end up that the amount that is charged is less than um, we're um, having households pay now who choose to US, use USA hauling. Um, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen or that that will uh, it, it's a slippery slope we're working on. And the reason I say that is because the costs um, in the trash business are going up and they're being passed on to consumers and uh, households and 
communities that contract directly, uh, whether it be the labor costs, the gasoline costs, the equipment costs, or the cost to, um, to have the uh, trash taken to a landfill or incinerator, which are the two methods of disposing of trash, um, they're all going up and that gets passed on. So um, I think uh, we, we know that um, a system such as we have now, the costs are gonna go up. Um, I think that they've actually held back on increases it's possible, I can't say for sure, because I'm obviously not um, in a position to know what their motives are, but uh, they're trying to, to encourage us not to change the system because they like the system the way it is. So it's, uh, but I think that there are costs that must be affecting them too, because it's affecting the entire industry. So, um, I'm hoping that you've uh, had a chance to look at that slide, um, and, and which then gets on to the next steps. And I, because I really want to limit the amount of time we, that I'm talking about this and let others um, ask questions and offer their thoughts about this. Um, but there, there are questions that we will have to answer, and um, the committee that Bob and I are on, which is the Town Services and Outreach Committee, is going to initially propose answers based upon information that we receive once we get that final round of responses to an RFP. And uh, these questions uh, will have to be determined because uh, they are part of any system. And uh, those of us who have been working on this have spoken with other towns and can talk to you about, we can talk to you about experiences that we've heard about from other communities, but I'm not gonna uh, start that now. I'm gonna let you um, ask questions and if something comes up in questions, we go forward. So I think that's basically it. I don't know if uh, there's any, uh, I think the questions so you see the current bylaw, and um, I think that's uh, the current bylaw is very brief because the current bylaw essentially says that the Board of Health is going to uh, insist on recycling and they're going to license haulers to uh, provide service. And right now, the, as noted, the major hauler that they've licensed is USA Hauling. So with that, I'll turn it back to the two district councilors and see if they want to uh, look for comments and questions. I do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, and I want to just give my uh, disclaimer one more time. If you are in our attendees, we have currently 16 folks in the attendees room. If you'd like to be on this screen with us, you can go ahead and raise your Zoom hand and I will bring you into this room. Uh, and you can always keep your camera off when you're in the room as well. But we will go ahead and take any questions folks have um, at this time. And um, yeah, we'll go we'll go with that. Oh, sorry. OK, uh, Rebecca, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk because you declined the invite for the um, room. So, Rebecca, if you unmute, you can go ahead. We're just having trouble with the buttons here. Oh, okay. Oh, hello. <laughs> you can just, it, I'll not, I won't decline the invite. Hold on. All right, no, you're, you're in. I think you're good. Okay, uh, good. Well, then, oh, there we go. Okay. But we didn't have a question. We. Well, welcome anyway. Um, happy to, happy to have you here. All right. Um, and if anyone else would like to, um, okay. All right, Alice, you can unmute if you'd like to ask your question. Well, it's not a, not a question, and, a, and I don't want to sound as if I'm complaining, but I really didn't know how to get to this program. I, I had to sort of, I mean, I, I have not been involved, in, and I still can't be involved. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. <clears throat> but I was interested in the topic. I mean, I knew, you know, through word of mouth that this was happening, 
And so I had to sort of look back and see who had emailed me about it. And, and eventually, I, oh, it didn't take me very long, but I, I had thought there might be some general announcement or something saying, if you want to be in, you know, if you want to, well, saying, for instance, the time and, and something to click on to, to get on. I eventually found that through the email that I had received, but, but it was uh, more laborious. I mean, if, if you only have a few people here, I think that may be a part of it that we just weren't reminded of how to get onto it. Anyway, I find it, it's very uh, interesting and I am, I'm being reminded of things that I knew about it. It doesn't, there's nothing here that surprises me, but I think I, it sounds like a good pro, good idea to me. Thank you for doing it. That's Thanks, that's all. And yeah, we, we hit a little bit of a snafu where there were some staff out this week that normally are helping us to post things on the community calendar. Uh, and so I think that that may have snagged us up a little bit. We do have, um, let's see, 15 folks in the attendees right now, um, which is great. So I thank you all for coming and we'll definitely look into making sure it's on all of the all of the bulletin boards and such next time. Um, I'm, we have I'm so out of it that I don't even pay attention to it, know that there is a community calendar. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, happy to hear <laughs> any other places that we should be posting it as well, always, um, for, for future reference. Thanks, Alice. Martha? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I have a, a couple questions and comments. So first question would be, has the RFP gone out for this? No, not yet. Um, the next step is that the town manager uh, needs to hire a consultant to help draft an RFP of this complexity and the subject that uh, we haven't issued a uh, request before on. So it's going to take a little bit of time. Plus, uh, he needs to identify the source of funds to pay that consultant. And uh, he is working on those issues. We expect that uh, he will make a presentation to uh, the Town Services and Outreach Committee and the Council in November um, about what um, how he's proposing to proceed. So we're kind of in a holding space right now. And I would like to make a, a strong plug for keeping the transfer station open for several reasons. One is for some people, it's an option so they don't have to pay for uh, the trash service at all. I take advantage of it, for example, and uh, because I only need to dispose of trash about once a month and compost. And I like the fact that uh, that they separate paper and um, and cans and bottles and so on, which USA doesn't and so on. So I, I really hope that the transfer station will stay open. They also take brush and leaves and everything else. It's, a, I think, a good town service, a really important one for a lot of people and a good meeting place on Saturday mornings. And the other thing is that don't ignore the rental apartments. They're a large percentage of our town and a large percentage of waste. In fact, uh, maybe they're, uh, uh, you know, I think a, a big emphasis should be put on a reduction of waste and working with landlords and renters if indeed we successfully go to this system. So thank you. And thanks for your work on this. Okay. Uh Two quick responses to the two issues, and then we'll go on. Uh, the Town Services Committee has, is itself very concerned about the transfer station and has uh, kept, uh, kept the transfer station as a priority of its own in any revision of the system. And uh, we uh, need some more information to sort of understand what that means. Um, and I'll simply because uh, if we can, if 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 a caller is going to bid a lower price per household if they have more households, then keeping the transfer station open will affect the cost of that the haulers are charging. We don't know if we'll find an answer to that through the RFP, but uh, there we know that there's. Um, several thousand people who rely on the transfer station and uh, we're an elected body and uh, 
that several thousand people are important voters. Uh, as far as the uh, question of apartment buildings, we want to move towards changing the system for apartment buildings too. They have such a very different system uh, because uh, apartment buildings for the most part have central trash hauling facilities um, in uh, dumpsters and things like that that pick up at, and so it's a, a whole different um, sy system in a way, and it'll be um, in the in sort of we concluded and um, the uh, uh, organization that's the advocacy group uh, uh, that has been working on this issue to zero waste Amherst has come to the same conclusion that uh, we need to uh, take steps, but and to get there to serve all households and eventually, hopefully, businesses and try and pick up, but that we we need to start someplace. And uh, I think you know we just chose uh, because it was I think affects a lot of people in a very dramatic way um, to to start with. Uh, people who currently live in households that are served by um, curbside pickup. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Martha. Um, Alice, your hand is still up. I'm not sure if that's a leftover from before uh, or if you have a new question, you're always welcome to ask it of Andy. Um, okay, so we're going to, Andy, thank you so much for the overview. And when can folks see this uh, being discussed again? When's the next time that this will be talked about and by whom? I think that the uh, important pieces are that uh, once we start work, uh, working with the consultant, we probably will be doing some community outreach to um, listen, hear questions that people need answers to because that helps frame the RFP. So that's probably the next stage in which we will be reaching out fairly broadly for community input. Right now, we're just trying to explain what it is that we're doing, but knowing that it's at the beginning, the uh, uh, so so that, that will be a key point. And uh, the other... Uh, will be after we get the RFP and have a lot have information in which we can make a proposal possibly and uh, it once that happens I think another round of uh, input is really important because this is something that affects everybody and we understand that and uh, we want to hear from everybody uh, once we have the RFP and we know what the uh, service that we can provide is and what the cost will be because we've gone through the RFP process. That will be sort of uh, another round and a very important round and something that I think the, the entire council will need to know what the outcome of that uh, process is, that outreach process. And Thank I also you. know that Bob is on the committee. So Bob, if you have anything that you want to add, please jump in. Yeah, this just I just wanted to say that this is not going to be quick. Uh, it's going to take a long time to really get uh, people's comments, get public input. And uh, the, the RFP process will take three to six months, probably. So um, it's, it's not going to happen like in January. Um, uh, so there's plenty of time for people to uh, express their opinions and uh, help to shape this program because it is a big change. It's a big change for the town and we recognize that and we definitely want to make sure that people are supportive of this and understand why we're doing it. So, um, you know, and, it, sorry. it's not going to happen fast. Uh, An RFP stands for re request for proposals, uh, which Andy it was would be where where companies respond back with what type of contract they would be able to offer the town for this type of uh, transaction. Correct. Correct. Great. Um, Katie Dixon Gordon. 
Hi, I just had a quick question. Thank you so much for this presentation and for doing the work. Um, I will just second that, you know, I would love if we had a way of being aware of these meetings. I suspect um, <laughs> that more people would come. And so it raises to me the question of community outreach. I love that you're doing that. But then the question is, what are the mechanisms by which that would happen? And how might normal people who don't necessarily regularly check the town calendar find out about it? Uh, Katie, you're saying that normal people are the ones who don't check the town calendar. Katie is a friend of mine, so I'm feeling okay about ragging on her. <laughs> you're calling me abnormal. She, she can rag on me. Yeah, yeah. I gotta say, like, I'm, like I, I honestly, like, I really think that it really has to be put right in front of my face for me to see it, <laughs> and I would love for important things like this to be right in front of my face somehow. So that's my. That's request. a really fair question, Andy. Do you have a? Um, so I think the. There's kind of two parts to it, right? There's the community outreach broadly, including things like this district meeting. Uh, but then, Andy, can you talk a little bit, if you know, I don't know if we have it established yet, about what mechanisms will be used for community outreach regarding waste hauler? Uh, no, no, we haven't um, devised the system that we plan to use. So um, I'm listening to what's being said today because, well, some of it is directed towards district meetings. Uh, some of it is directed towards outreach in general. And yeah. um, so I really appreciate what I'm hearing. Uh, uh, if yeah. folks have suggestions, I, I just want to say something. Um, I did try to reach out to uh, people via email. If you did not get an email from me, please send me an email. Just Hegner R at amherstmad.gov. And um, I will put, add you to the distribution list. And so whenever we have another, our next meeting, I'll send out, uh, you know, I, I sent out a, a heads up about a week before this meeting. And then I sent out a, a reminder uh, with the, the more detailed, uh, you know, call in and all that. So if you did not get an email from me, then just please, and you want to be, want to reach out, want me to reach out to you, then please just send me an email and I will, put you on the list. We have to build our email list from scratch. So it's a bit tough yeah. um, to, we don't have access to folks' emails. So unless you tell us that you want emails from us, we don't have, that is a, not a mechanism that we can kind of automatically what, get. Um, what an, a mechanism potentially, sorry to interrupt and to jump yeah. in. You're fine. Um, but I really appreciated being added to the distribution list. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering like if we could have a little bit of a snowball method um of having pardon me olivia um, from my mommy <laughs> sorry from my, mommy and oh. my snack annabelle eat your snack i'm so got good my thought is if we could use that distribution list and have everybody message to their respective listeners champ like like neighborhoods and that kind of thing it would be one way of building up that that um mailing list yeah what we could do katie is we could make maybe a simple google form that uh would would allow us to capture emails and if we send that out and people can send that to the folks they know who then could opt in to um to getting emails from us in the future i that is absolutely something bob and i can talk about uh and and move forward on yeah, just so you know that um, there is a privacy issue. So I, I, when I send it out, I send it, I send out the list as a BCC. So it's it's private, and I don't want to, you know, disturb anyone's pri privacy. So um, that that's a, that's the only issue with kind of a a broad, more broad distribution. But I'm, I'm happy to, you know, add people if if you can forward emails to them and have them email me and I added so about 10 people to the list uh, based on the, the, the emails I sent out. So, and so in addition to email, the other, um, there's a website the town uses called Engage Amherst, where for major projects where we're seeking feedback, uh, they, they get posted to the um, Engage Amherst website. Um, and those typically get a little bit of a shout out on the town webpage. Uh, and that is, the website is just engageamherst.org. Um, and so, you know, 
current featured projects are, are on there. One of the things that just showed up on there recently is the town manager perfor performance evaluation. Um, so that is a good place to check. But then the um, the town website, we have recently hired a new communications person, Samantha, who's doing a phenomenal job. Uh, we had lost Brianna a while uh, I think a year ago um, to she had moved on. And so we brought in someone new to do communications and she's really upping the game also on the town's um, social media profiles and sending out um, press releases. So it, there was a bit of a, a gap in staffing um, and that is getting ramped up. So I would say those would be the places I would I would kind of not saying you have to check them regularly, but to, to keep in your ideas for rotation are the town webpage and social media accounts, as well as engage Amherst for more kind of intensive community feedback type mechanisms. And then Bob and I will keep um, on our email list as well. Thanks, Katie. I'm going to go to Alice, then Martha, then Anita. Alice? Uh, you're muted, Alice. I don't know. Oh, there you I go. Have I know I, I I went off and then I came back because the, I, I got excited. Um, but Love it. the way I found out about this, there was a group of my neighborhood of people, my friends in South Amherst, who told me about this. And I sent a message to Bob, but I apparently did not get on the list because I did not hear anything more. And wow. so it's at AC Swift at Comcast. Okay. We'll make but sure I'll, you're on there, Alice. Thank, thank you. you. Um, because this is near and dear to my heart, but one reason I not, have not been <clears throat> particularly involved is that I live at Applewood, which is a wonderful place, but our trash does not go through the, the town uh, you know, services. Uh, uh, but I was chair of the um, sustainability committee until quite recently, and, and uh, so we have a, a very active group there that's been working on, and that's how I know about all these things and the possibility of this program and and just think that it's great and I hope you can keep going with the you know what you're what you are presenting tonight thank you thank you Martha <laughs> yes I guess I just wanted to second what Katie had said of quote normal people don't always follow our town's website uh you know it is a real problem, I think, in our town of trying to get communications out. And I think maybe we need to try some normal, some some novel approaches. I mean, one thing that our, our league committee was talking about, in fact, was having uh, some kind of just a simple billboard outside town hall. And so you could have some one message a week, whatever was the most important thing could, could be out there. Or... Uh, if you have things like district meetings, you could send a general announcement to Applewood with a poster to put up so that everyone there could could learn uh, and, you know, posters at town hall. And uh, there are there are a lot of different approaches. And maybe sometime one of your council committees could think a little more about it or engage with Samantha. But uh, thank you anyway and there are a few people that are here tonight because i forwarded the emails so again thank you bob for um starting the process thank you martha anita hi thanks and can can i turn this or we finish talking about the waste hauler because i had some other things yeah so then um, we definitely can move on uh, after Waste Hauler. Andy and I were going to give some quick updates, but we can shift to question and answer now, and we can give our updates after that, too, as well. So okay. feel free to ask your question. Okay. I'm looking forward to the updates. Um, first, I wanted to thank both of you for the position that, that you took at yesterday's town council meeting, especially around the Black reparations. Um, I think it's really imperative that um, those people who are most affected um, by, by the harms and can chart the best course. And certainly the town council has ultimate authority uh, to make decisions, but um, I, I appreciate it the way both of you um, had gently pushed back and, and uh, supported Dr. Shabazz and, and Michelle. Um, but um, uh, what I wanted, I wanted to just mention um, 
is if you were aware of, um, people are calling it a petition, but it has to do with the library project. It's really more in the form, I think, of a survey. And um, Maria Kopecki, I believe, had submitted it to town council um, a while back and hadn't received any, any feedback. And certainly it doesn't require any action um, by town council because it doesn't fall within the definitions within the charter or the rules about how official pe uh, petitions um, are handled. But, but I felt that it, it provided some meaningful information um, that has been somewhat lost in town. I think there's an assumption that those who have expressed concerns about the library project at, as it's defined now are a handful of malcontents and naysayers. And I think with over a thousand people signing this and expressing their concern. And what is interesting about there, there were also some feedback questions and um, one was, did you originally support the project? And the answer by 31% was yes, they had. And then the question was, what has changed your mind? And it was cost um, by over 80%. So I, I think it, it provides a little bit of information that I hope all of the counselors um, are aware of um, and that if there are any questions about it or feedback, you can contact me, you can contact Maria um, and, and we'd be happy to engage in a conversation. It's, it's really in the interest of being part of the conversation. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, I think there's a lot of mis misunderstanding um, um, about people who have expressed concerns, and I'm I'm hoping that this petition goes a little way. So I guess my core question is: Have any of you seen it? Have you reacted to it, or is it just something that is to be ignored or not have any value to you? Um, I'll speak for myself uh first in terms of the last questions you asked we did see the email from uh, maria um it did not to my recollection i it included a link to where to sign the petition but it did not include a link to the signatories just um so it's mm -hmm. not just uh, uh, which is fine i just wanted to clarify we haven't seen the actual yes. like of sign yes um, you're right but i i think any public comment is always welcome and you know mm -hmm. we read them and we do take them under consideration. I think at this stage of the project, Bob actually would be able to speak to that more as someone in, on finance committee. I think finance has been discussing this more mm -hmm. and Andy more actively, but to just to answer the last part of your question, public comments don't do nothing. They are, um, and especially I'll, I'll just put in a plug for public comments that are um, this is not an example of this, Anita. I'm, I'm kind of going on a little bit of a, a tangent about public comments, so please know this is not directed at, at this email. Um, public comments that are not copy pastes. Public comments that actually talk yeah. about your experience and your perspective are what we want to hear. Um, it's not about necessarily about quantity as much as it's about quality. Um, you know, so I, I, I just want to say that for folks who are considering writing to the council. Um, please always tell us what you think. Um, and, and that's not to say starting with a form letter or whatever is not helpful. Um, that can be a really good jumping off point, but it's really helpful for me, I'm speaking for myself, for me to hear why you feel the way you do and what impacts you in your life in Amherst. Um, so please keep writing to us. We do read them. Um, yeah, I, I, if I could it, yes, just absolutely. respond to that, I, I, I agree that individual comments that come from an, a, a unique individual perspective is important. And certainly this, you know, what you receive does not fit that, but it is an, an expression. And I think 
if you are open to learning more about kind of what went into it and what we have been able to make sense of and what the process was in gathering those signatures. I mean, there were a lot of discussions with people. So if any town councilor would find benefit in hearing more about that process and more about that background, please contact me and I'd be happy to meet with you. I know Maria and others would be happy to meet with you. Um, so it's, it's really offered as, as something that we thought would, would add to the conversation and, and uh, benefit it and, and begin a conversation or maybe further a conversation rather than just be, here, here's a bunch of information, you know, go use it. You know, I, th I think it's got some potential in there for opening up more input from the public. Thank you, Anita. And and yes, yes. to be clear, I'm not discounting a, a petition at all. Um, there is- I get, I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And um, I appreciate it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so thank you. Um, Bob, anything to, to add on that? No, um, I, you know, I, uh, Anita, you know, I've met with Maria several times to talk about this and, and you and, and others. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big issue in town. I recognize it is. It is. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I just so everyone knows when I put this email list together, I put it t based on people who had emailed me. Some people mm -hmm. emailed me saying nice things about me. Some people emailed me saying not so nice things about me. You know, I don't care. You know, I mean, I want to hear from everybody. Um, and I'm not, I didn't filter anything um, on purpose. I mean, I tried to, to, to get everybody. I, you know, uh, Alice, I mistakenly didn't get you on the list. I make, make sure you get on the list. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it, I, I, I recognize and I value everyone's comments. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the time that you've given me and Maria and others. And uh, just one other comment, you know, the section 106 process has been lumbering along and there's also an environmental component an environmental assessment that has to be completed in order to uh, satisfy the needs of the HUD and, and NEH. And that's, $2.1 million that are at stake. So I, I hope, I know every town councilor is just overwhelmed with all the responsibility that you have, but I'm hoping you, you're you tracking that because that has a financial impact. Um, and it could, you know, the concern around the finances is what effect does this one project have to the detriment of other you know, significant needs and how do we balance them? But, you know, if that's, those are all conversations for another day, which, you know, again, I'm, I'm happy to engage with, with anyone about, about this. So please, you know, if I could be helpful or informative, let me know. You're muted. Huh? I, I, I I'll get there eventually, you know, it's all, I talk <laughs> enough anyway. Um, all right, so we're going to go to, <laughs> we're going to go to Martha and then Kathleen. Um, and Kathleen, if you'd like to be promoted to panelists, I'm going to send you a link. You don't have to accept it. I will still allow you to talk either way, but Martha, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Just to follow up. I think there is a way to submit a formal petition to the town council yes, there is. that a certain subject be brought up for discussion. Could you briefly explain what that process is? Yes. Um, so the, um, hang on, I just have it pulled up. So uh, uh, under the charter sections 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, there are, uh, those are four different ways that voters can submit petitions to the council. Um, they Each of them are for different things, right? So open meeting of the residents, uh, a free petition, initiative measures, or voter, ve voter veto uh, petitions. Those are all ways that folks can submit formal petitions, and those are all referenced and outlined in the, um, the town charter. Uh, so I, I won't read through all of them right now, but those are the relevant sections 8.123 and 4 in the charter. Did that answer your question, Martha? Great. Okay. 
Uh, Kathleen, go ahead. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. I'm I'm so glad that you all had this opportunity for us to connect. Um, my comment is about the budget and specifically priorities and guidelines with uh, respect to the schools. As I've been educating myself about the budget, I see that in the narrative in the you know fiscal year 25 budget, there's mention of how the residents want a continuation of the high level of services. And the first service mentioned there is robust public schools. And at the same time, the past practice has always been, it seems, that while the overall municipal budget is held to the same percentage increase as the schools and the library, the individual departments within the municipal budget are not. And that has meant, in, at least in FY25, that many departments had very large increases year over year, um, much larger than the 4% that the, you know, that the schools and the library were allocated. So I understand that this is the way that things have been done, but my concern is that this practice limits the ability of the schools to remain robust in the same way that other municipal services are able to do. So I would love to see the uh, town manager guidelines moving forward better reflect the stated um, budget priorities so that the schools are not held to a more stringent standard than um, other services provided in town and are indeed allowed to, um, you know, continue to remain robust. So that, that yeah, that, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate what you, uh, what you're saying, and I agree, it's one of the areas that we're trying to do advocacy with our state delegation as well um, and work with them on on reevaluating the funding formula. Uh, I think this is my perspective on it is at the end of the day, that's something that's really hurting communities like Amherst. And we're seeing this with with Northampton, with had everybody in our area, to be honest, we're what are called minimum aid districts. And so we receive the the uh, minimum per pupil aids. So there's state advocacy that needs to be to be done um, as well. To get to your question, I think one of the challenges that comes with that type of model is that there are departments. Like, so so we break it up between the four major areas, right? Right now, so we have municipal services, schools, library, etc. And so the issue there is that the schools also contain specific departments. And so if we get down to the department level at the town, should we also be getting down to within the schools a, a specific increase for the the different areas within the schools? I think that's one of the questions that I have um, when this gets brought up is who, you know, does only one major area get broken into departments? Do they all get broken into departments? Um, I think there's, there's ways to talk through that to figure out what makes sense. The what doing the not level by the department allows us to do is it allows for flexibility to meet needs year over year within each area, right? So there are some years where we've, um, for example, recently we hired new folks in our DEI team. We increased the, the numbers on that team. So that budget number went up exponentially, um, whereas we would not have been able to add personnel in that area if we'd only done 3%, 3%, 3%. So I don't, um, it's not that, I think those are, I'm speaking again for myself as an individual in terms of the concerns that I see in that model. Um, and I'm happy to talk more, but I also, I'm no longer on finance committee. So I'm gonna look at um, Bob and Andy to speak to this as well, if you have thoughts. Well, uh, the, the we we uh, on the finance committee we have floated the idea that maybe we should relook at the the sort of the equal distribution of of you know increases across departments uh, across you know major budget areas. Um, so you have you've got the town, you've got the library, you've got the elementary school, and you have the regional school. And we've we've we're, we'll probably take a look at. Uh, whether or not we should be doing a different allocation. Uh, I agree with Anna, though, that if we, we, we don't want to get down at the budget level, uh, at the department level, because um, you've got departments in, in all, of, all of the four uh, sections of the town. 
And so um, what, where, you, where do you stop? And where does it um, start interfering with the other elected officials in town whose job it is to look at the budgets um, and how they distribute, look at how they distribute their money uh, across the, the different schools or uh, the different departments in the schools. So um, I, I, it's, a, it's a complicated situation I, I, and it's a very bad situation right now. Um, everybody's, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out the best way we can move forward to keep the education uh, as good as we can um, and not, you know, we can't, we, we can't print money. You know, we, we only have so much money. So that's the, that's the dilemma we have. Andy, do you want to say anything? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is a very difficult subject and one that we, um, I reflect on both on the local level and the statewide level because I'm on the, a member of the Fiscal Policy Committee of the Statewide Association. And we talk about school funding all of the time because it is a statewide issue. The reality is that the cost of education is going up at a faster percentage than revenue is going up. So that as long as that is happening, and it's probably happening for a variety of reasons, um, it creates a dilemma because if you continue to say that you need to hold the schools harmless from reduction as then uh, eventually it it eats everything up and there's nothing left and and we know that the schools are important which is why this is tough and so we struggle with this issue i'm not saying that in the, the example that i give and i don't do this lightly is that um the amount that's being uh, that is being asked by the regional schools in their first presentation, which is not their final presentation, was an initial presentation. The amount that they asked for for an increase uh, is greater than the entire current budget of CRESS. So just to ask you to think about that and think about how, as a council, we should be considering these kinds of issues. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, and this partly comes from local and partly from statewide, there are drivers that are driving up the costs, and we understand that. And um, I don't want to be neglecting um, sensitivity towards the tremendous problems that the school committee and the superintendent are facing. Uh, but there are a couple of things that they are dealing with that then get passed through. And it's hard to say that the town can make up the difference when our um, increase is limited by proposition two and a half and the amount that we can raise. One is that state aid generally has been going down over years. And if you look at any graph of how state aid has been for um, not just education, but all uh, municipal programs, but in this case, particularly education, it is going down. And um, if you adjust it for inflation, it's even a steeper slope going down. Um, Second thing is special education costs have been increasing. And I think that that's true statewide. It's not just true locally, but that's certainly affecting it. Um, and then there's the question of uh, charter schools and um, uh, how charter schools um, are funded is by uh, somebody chooses to go to a charter school and that tuition is reduced from the uh, from the, the budget. So the regional schools are lo losing about eighteen thousand dollars for each student who's going to uh, the charter school, uh, whether it be Chinese immersion or any of the other charter schools. 
And that is because of the amount that we're spending on education in Amherst. And it creates this anomaly that people who live in Hadley, where they're spending less on education per student, um, their tuition payments are less. So that in effect, Amherst is being put in a position under the current formulation of subsidizing another community. Um, and there are a lot of other problems. I could go on for much longer than I think you care for me to go on because I've been working on this quite heavily on the state committee. Uh, but charter school um, is another factor that we just need to recognize. So, you know, all of these things are complex. Um, I, it's important to hear your priorities, but, um, and, and I appreciate hearing the priorities, which is why I'd, I'd uh, like to be at the meeting and why I'm going to stop talking so that uh, Anna can uh, recognize others. Thanks, Andy. So um, Kathleen, I'm going to go back to you uh, in a moment. I'm being cognizant of time. So we're going to take a couple more questions. And then um, Bob and I would love to tell you what else we're working on. Um, so just everyone look at the just keep keep an eye on the clock as we think about your questions. We will always happily sit down and talk with you more uh, individually. And um, we have another district meeting in December that we'll make sure to mention as well. Kathleen, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Just yeah, so you know. I just wanted to just follow up very quickly. I, I don't want to take time from anyone else. And I would love to talk about it further. I'm actually like very at this point, pretty well versed in all of these costs and the state issues and advocating at the state level. But one thing that just sticks out to me is that when Andy says that, um, you know, the cost of education is is rising faster than the revenue, um, well, that is also true of many other departments, because if you read through the budget, what it shows is that the reason that many of these departments um, uh, year over year percentage is increasing so fast is be due to step and cost of living increases, which is the exact same pressure that the schools are under. So that that is just something that really sticks out to me in terms of um, Need, need, needing that to be part of the conversation because I think it's a somewhat unrealistic expectation that the schools are are facing compared to you know other other parts of the town budget. So and with that, I'll let someone else get a word in. Thanks, Kathleen. And please feel free to reach out. Um, Bob and I are always really happy to sit down and, and meet either in in person or on Zoom. Um, or yeah. Uh, we're going to go to Julian, and then I see some folks. Just Julian, really quickly before you go, before you start, um, folks who are in the audience with your hands raised, I'm going to send you invites to join as panelists if you'd like to. You can always decline them, and then I will allow you to talk. Um, but just to give you the option if you'd like it, uh, Julian, go ahead whenever you want. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree with everything Kathleen said, um, and my question was on a similar note slightly different, which is in the budget process, the town manager has a fair say. Obviously, the council gets the final vote and the school committee votes the school budget and the library votes the library budget. But the town manager has a fairly significant say in his proposed budget of how much money goes to the schools, how much money goes to the other departments, etc. in the proposal that he brings forward. Um, that historically usually gets approved or closely approved. Um, so what I'm wondering is when we look at the town manager goals, there's all these different sections of, you know, a lot, a lot of great admirable goals about everything from climate action to housing affordability to racial equity to building projects, et cetera. Should we have a goal that specifically directs the town manager to fund and continue funding educational services um, through the schools and be like, hey, we're saying that you as the manager have a directive to, it says, continue providing the same town municipal services. So if we want to use that same directive for the schools, I think that would be a fair way to say the town manager should propose a budget that tries to maintain services as level as he can, um, even if that means reducing from other areas or taking from this or working on certain grants or whatever. Um, so I was wondering if that could be 
sort of wrapped into the town manager goals discussion somehow. So Julian, I think I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to answer this and then I'll, I'll rely on Andy to um, correct whatever I get wrong. Uh, the town manager doesn't set the school budget. So that is set by the superintendent and the school committee. What happens is the budget coordinating group and the finance committee set budget guidelines. And those are what support the percentage increase per area, right? So those budget guidelines, that budget guidelines document, which comes from the council is informed by, I know I need a flow chart, but is informed by a group called the budget coordinating group, which includes representatives from the libraries, the schools, the town council, and the town manager's uh, office as well. And that group comes together to talk about what the needs are in each area. Um, from there, the council sets the budget guidelines and the, the town manager creates a budget within those. The town manager does not dictate what where money goes within the school budget, and it's the budget guidelines that dictate the 3% to everyone or differing amounts uh, as as appropriate. So not really to your to your question because the town that's not under the town manager's purview um, uh, to to say fiscal responsibility for the schools. Um, that's the responsibility of the the school committee and the budget coordinating group to create the school committee to deal with the budget that the schools get and, and figure that out and the budget coordinating group to communicate that need and then the council to write the budget guidelines. Bob or Andy, did I did I get anything incorrect in my very quick overview of that process? Well, finance committee also uh, drafts recommendations oh, yeah. for for the uh, guidelines, but yes, it's the council who, who actually uh, decides what the guidelines are. Julian, did that answer your question? Sort of. I guess more was what I was getting at was seeing if the town manager, sort of directing the town manager to comb through the budget and identify areas that could be used to support the schools instead of what they're currently doing or to work through the budget to see where efficiencies could be found that could go towards funding the schools. Like if that's sort of a task or project, we could put the town manager on. I think the way that that would happen is if the budget, if the budget guidelines say the schools are getting this percentage and everyone else is getting less. And so then the town manager would need to figure out how to make that work within those percentages, not the other way around, right? So so the, the percentages guide the line items, um, the percentage increases guide the line item, guide the line items. I don't know if um, Bob or Andy, if doing line item budgeting, um, this has been brought up, I think, by the schools um, to talk about for their own process of doing line item budgeting, where folks kind of have to advocate for every dollar versus fitting within a percentage. I think that is a larger conversation um, that I, I believe could shift. I don't know if it would get to where I think you're talking about wanting to get it to go to. Um, the current process, and I believe the process that folks are working towards for the for this coming fiscal year is to do that. This is the percent finagle within. Um, and and I think the budget coordinating group is the group that would say schools get X amount, library X amount, or sorry, the budget coordinating group is who requests that the budget guidelines specify that percentage amount. Yeah, that, that, that yeah. somewhat makes sense, I guess. Just thinking to wrap it up, but like a downfall of that model might be you're asked to fit within your certain percentage where that money goes within the percentage, you could end up making a pretty big cut to the schools while spending elsewhere where it might not really make sense. I, I hear that. Oh, um, yeah, the, there's absolutely downsides to both practices. Um, Andy, was did you have a response to this specifically? You, real quickly, it just we actually start the budget by talking about revenue and not talking about expenditures. And uh, revenue in Amherst is very limited because of two and a half, uh, which uh, limits our in annual increase in the amount that we can raise from property tax which is our largest revenue source to two and a half percent per year, which really uh, in the best of years covers inflation. It never covers more than inflation. And uh, so we have to, we, we have to recognize that um, it's really a revenue problem. And 
uh, a lot of communities of our size have uh, places I'd like to pick on Northampton because they're just so close and so easy. But they have King Street and they have lots of car dealers and other things that uh, we go to all the time um, and spend our money at. Uh, but uh, we don't have the kind of commercial base that um, Northampton or, Hat or Hadley or some of the other com communities have. Northampton is more analogous because of its size. And uh, the um, flip side of it is that uh, we have three nonprofits that don't pay taxes, but generate lots of community needs. So you put it all together and um, I, I recognize that you're talking about a spending solution, but I think that the problem also and even greater is a revenue problem. Thanks, Andy. And we will be getting our um, uh, financial indicators presentation at the council's November 7th, Fourth. November 4th meeting. Thank you. Um, so folks would like to kind of see where things are heading, uh, tune into the council meeting then. I'm writing down the names in order um, because it gets a little jumbled with who's on in the room versus not. Uh, so we're going to go to Ellen and then Jennifer, then Katie, then I don't know if it's Andrea or Andrea, but Okay, um, so Ellen, you go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Ellen Jedry Gadera, and uh, thank you for having this meeting. I didn't actually realize there were individual district meetings, so it's nice to meet all of you on a screen. And I'm sorry, I I think I missed the window where I could have had my camera on. Um, I don't really have anything prepared, but I'm really here to tell you that the reason we are here in Amherst, and I have a two young kids at Crocker Farm. The reason we are here is our schools. That's why we moved here. That's why we bought a house here. That's why we pay higher taxes. That is why we came. My husband's family um, came here when he was a teenager and he attended Amherst High School. And we just knew the reputation, both for general education and special education. And the cuts that are being proposed are so dire. Um, it's, it, I know this is happening across the state, but I guess I just wanna ask the town about our priorities and, and where they are because we came here because that's our priority and we have a family. But education in Amherst, at least to us, always seemed to be a priority and it's not feeling that way right now. Um, I do want to mention um, there was a question in an article about the four towns meeting. Is our special education best and our general education basic? Our special education is not best. It's not in any way best. Um, the numbers, you know, we used to have two speech pathologists at Crocker Farm. We now have one for the entire caseload. Um, it's we know our kids need more than what we're getting and the costs have increased, but when you can't retain staff and instead have to pay contractors like we're doing at the middle school for over a year now, they haven't had a speech pathologist. There's no been nobody to fill the position. We have to fill those positions and retain them and spend our money more wisely um, and keep those wonderful staff that we have because our teachers and staff um, are incredible and we love them and we want them to do their best and not be stressed. Um, and one other thing I want to mention just about the charter schools, I've just been messing around on the DESE website with the data and it looks like the jump, like all around Massachusetts, kids are leaving public schools going to charter schools and they, there's this funding issue that goes along with it. But this year, if you look at the data that's on the DESE website, it actually says 329 students instead of 150. Um, that doesn't match necessarily the district data. That's like, it, the, the data look a little weird, but I'd like to, I guess, look into that a little further. But it, it does appear people are not leaving Amherst, but the kids are leaving our school systems. And I think that's because of all the problems we're we're facing. So um, sorry that was 
not completely organized and I would love another chance to maybe write to Anna and Bob. Um, but I just want to say that we need to do the best we can for our schools and keep them as a top priority. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I agreed. I, I think, yeah, I agree. Um, okay. Uh, Jennifer questions, comments, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Jennifer Curiali. Uh, I live on Woodlot Road in Amherst. I have a fourth grader in uh, Fort River. Um, just very briefly, I'm here. This is the first time I've ever attended a council meeting, and uh, I'm here solely to speak about the schools. Um, I consider myself locally a single issue voter. Um, I vote on people who support our schools. Uh, for people who support our schools. And I think that I really want to thank Kathleen because she's been working tirelessly to help all of us understand budget issues and how they pertain to our schools. Um, I think Kathleen was very generous when she said our schools, or she wants to keep our schools robust. <laughs> I don't think our schools are robust. I don't think they've been robust for a long time. Um, from where I live on Woodlot Road, I can I can actually point to five homes of five different families who in the last year or two have pulled their children out of Fort River. Our schools are declining. Our schools are losing students. Our schools need to be funded. It's not that education is important. Education is crucial. Um, and, and I just want to push back a little bit very respectfully on this, um, the, the special education costs. Special education is education. Special education is just education. All of our students deserve an education, whatever that takes. Um, I know people constantly kind of point out the cost of special education versus education. It's all just education. All of our residents matter. All of our students matter. Um, so I just really want to highlight that I am very concerned about the state of our schools. Um, we are we 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 live here. My husband is a tenured professor at UMass. We we plan on staying here. Um, I would like to be able to educate my son using the Amherst schools um, throughout. So I just really want to highlight and urge all of you um, to really prioritize and focus on whatever you can do to help our children in our schools. Thank you for listening and thank you for your work. Thank you, Jennifer. Andrea? Oh, yeah, Andrea and then Katie, sorry. Andrea, thank you. Hi, thank you for having this meeting and I'm going to be another voice for um, to ask you all to help our schools. I was uh, raised in Amherst in the 70s and 80s, graduated from Amherst High School in 1990. So I'm a product of the town when it uh, had a robust school system. And just this summer moved back with my family. Um, I have a middle schooler and a child at Fort River. And it's been like heartbreaking for me to see the state that the schools are in <clears throat> and um, I am not an expert on the budget and the minutia of financing and I don't want to have to be in order to have my voice taken seriously as a parent and resident and I want to know how to drive home this point that parents are so concerned I have not any parent I speak to is gravely concerned. I, I, you know, I'm, I, um, and, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I just, I don't know how more clearly to say that all the new parents I'm meeting at all the activities the kids are joining all the meetings, everyone is worried and you, we move here and now all of a sudden we're saying to ourselves, do we have to pull the kids out of school? We just moved the family here. Is this, can, uh, or can our kids actually be educated here? So I, beseech you to take uh, seriously this issue that this is a priority for people in the town and that it's gonna, um, I don't know, uh, we need your help. So that's what I'm here for. And thank you for your time. Thank you all. Um, I'm also an Amherst graduate and uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I relate to some of the things that you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, Katie? Same. Um, I'm a parent of two kids, as you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and that shouldn't mean I'm the, like, parents are not the only ones who should be worried. We don't, I'm not a 
on the I, as you know, I didn't even know these things happened. I mean, I knew Anna was doing these because it's, you know, important. Um, but I, I didn't, I'm here because I'm not a politician. I'm not an accountant. I do understand the, di the difficulty vaguely of, of having no revenue and a lot of expenses. I was, I was a graduate student for a long time. So I'm very familiar with that problem. Um, I think that this is a top priority issue and past budget models or whether we do line item review, I don't think it matters. Something has to happen because people will leave Amherst. I pay an exceptional amount of property taxes and I can't do that and pay for private school. And I have to make a choice. I will make a choice. And I don't want to make that choice. I want us to be a place that is such a wonderful place to be because our public schools are so strong and we value education and whatever the model should be. Tell us what we can do to make, um, make more revenue. How can we put pressure on Amherst College? I would love to go viral on Twitter if that's what it takes. And honestly, I want you all to be the ones leading us there. Um, I want you all as our representatives to help us figure out how to fix this problem because um, we can't do the business as usual here. It's it's really on fire. Um, so thank you so much for all of the work that you do. Sorry to put this in your lap. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks, y'all. Um, I think so. I like district meetings because we're allowed to have conversation with you and during public comment in town council meetings, we can't reply. So um, I, I just wanted to appreciate that, uh, this this forum for that. I think something, the first thing is to, to keep talking to us um, and recognize, I think I'll speak for myself, recognize that this is a really tough, the, the, conversations around budget are really, really hard because there are, the town has so many wonderful things and necessary things that it spends money on. So know that, um, I think, I, I think I'm pleading a bit for, uh, both strong voices and compassion at the same time, which we have to earn compassion. That's fair. But I think, um, please keep talking to us and keep explaining, uh, your your passion for this issue and um and i agree with andrea what you said about you shouldn't need to be an expert on the budgeting process in order to to have your voice heard and um i think that's one of the forms for things like this is where we can talk through what that process is and uh help you in advocating in, in effective ways talking to us is absolutely the one way and and communicating how important this is and that this is more important than other things to you, right? Like um, the other big expenditure item that we hear a lot about is is paving of roads and uh, adding bike lanes and things like that. And those are all really, really important and really, really expensive. Um, you know, so I think it's it's if we're prioritizing everything for you, hearing where your priorities are is really, really helpful for me at least. And I don't want to speak for for Bob and Andy, um, but for me, it is helpful to know what what your priority is. Um, the other thing here is that advocating to, uh, our, our state reps don't just talk to counselors, right? Um, advocate to our state delegation for changes in these funding formulas. Kathleen, it sounds like you've been really, um, pivotal in helping move that from, uh, from a resident level, right? And know that on the council level, um, we're working on trying to, on, on, on that advocacy as well. Um, these are formulas that are, that that don't help towns like Amherst. Uh, and so that's both formulas such as how they uh, dole out what's called chapter 90 money, which is uh, to pay for like paving of roads and, and such, right? That's based on population, not on or, or the formula, the way that the formula works hurts towns like Amherst that have a small amount of land and a transient population, right? So, um, there are changes in both the charter formula and the um, roads formula that we would benefit hugely from being rewritten. Um, things like pilot payments uh, on state-owned land or on um, 
uh, on, on higher education institutions. Those are also things that we appreciate hearing advocacy on. But I think that's kind of my my ask is that your your advocacy be two pronged advocate to the town council, but also um, speak with your with your state legislators as well on this issue. Yeah, I should point out that Mindy Dom is a district five resident. So <laughs> yes. and she was sorry she couldn't be with us tonight, um, but we will try to get her with us at the next meeting as well. Oh, and yeah. And so your state your state rep is Mindy Dom and your state senator is Joe Comerford. Um, and those folks would be it's it's helpful for them to know what residents are caring about. And that's that's one thing we know our residents care about. Um, OK, I want to give Oh, Jennifer, your hand is still up. Did you want to add anything else? No, I apologize. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I just didn't want to accidentally cut you off. Um, so I'm going to give a really quick update on on things that are things we're working on uh, at the council level, and I'm probably going to miss some things. So this is just what I'm most excited about right now. Um, bear with me for that. So last night we um, referred a motion to establish school zones at the middle school and the high school. Um, Andy's commit and Bob is on TSO as well. Our town services and outreach committee will be um, discussing that in the coming weeks. They're working on waste hauler, as you know. Um, I am the chair of our governance organization and legislation committee, and we are currently working on the town manager goals for 2025. So um, this is the process by which kind of the council sets priorities, but also the process by which we uh, tell the town manager what direction we'd like him to go in for the coming year. Um, so GOL takes a first pass at that, and then the council uh, um, has final, obviously the full council has final vote. <clears throat> and I'm trying to introduce a slightly different method this year to make it a bit more organized. And then this was mentioned by someone before, but GOL is also working on the uh, successor committee to the um, African Heritage Reparation Assembly. So looking at what the next iteration of reparations in Amherst looks like uh, and the charge for that committee. And then, uh, as has been mentioned uh, several times, we are working on, uh, we are heading full tilt into budget season. Um, and so we will be hearing our, our uh, financial indicators at our meeting on November 4th. Uh, and that will be kind of the first, one of the first, um, try not to use the word in the definition, but the indicators of where we are and, and where we stand currently. Um, and then CRC is currently working on the solar bylaw uh, there and they have just finished their work and the council has passed the nuisance property bylaw and um, nuisance house bylaw as well. Or No, wait, what did I do? Nuisance property and um, rental registration, sorry, bylaw uh, are, are what we're currently working on or currently passed. Bob, any, uh, I know, I know that was like the top five things on my brain, but what else? Yeah, there's some other things going on. Uh, first of all, I will send out a form uh, tomorrow to all everyone on the list to evaluate the town manager. Please feel free to evaluate the town manager any way you you choose to. Um, and uh, there's our, your opportunity to direct the manager to do things differently. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, one uh, one thing that council has done is we've passed a a um, well we've accepted a state law that would set the default speed limit in Amherst at 25 miles per hour. We're trying to do traffic calming um, to to make things better. In addition to the school zones that that we we are working on, um, we're also working on in general reducing. Uh, speed limits. Um, we do have this. We there's two ways that we could do that. One is to do it street by street, or do it uh, as sort of as you come into town. It'll say the default speed limit is 25 miles per hour. We have those signs. We're working on trying to get you know <clears throat> get them out and figure out how to how to reset what we can. Um, there's no guarantee that every 30 mile per hour zone will be reset to 25. Uh, but uh, we, we at least have that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> um, you may have heard about the Southeast Street project. Um, there, the, the initial concept is to put four roundabouts in, one at the intersection with 
<coughs> College Street, Belcher Town Road, that, um, that intersection, one of the south entrance to the school, to the, to the uh, Fort River School, one at the north entrance and one at, 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 uh, at College at, uh, Main Street. Um, and um, <coughs> we've, <coughs> we've compiled the, uh, the GOL committee compiled a list of questions that came partly from the from the counselors as well as our own questions that we we had um, and uh, we're going to be following up with uh, you know trying to um, make see what the, the the responses are to our questions but we're it's we're definitely making sausage right now it's it's not a done deal um, <coughs> but um, it's um, a very very tricky, situation traffic wise and it's it's um the idea is to try to uh make it better um and uh with consolidating the two elementary schools into one school it's going to make what currently is a bad problem worse um <clears throat> as um a, a way to try to increase revenues in town um we're tr we're we're looking at um an overlay, what's called an overlay district uh, in um, University Drive. <clears throat> um, we're, again, it's, we're making sausage right now. We've had some back and forth with the, uh, with the, the planning department. Um, but uh, the idea would be to create <clears throat> um, mixed use uh, buildings there um, that would then generate um, uh, revenues to the town. Um, again, we we don't know specifically what the the, the final um, outcome will be. We're 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 it's in the early stage of the process, but we are working on that. Um, and I think that's that's probably it. But I I wanted to make sure people knew that we were work um, we're working on on traffic calming across the the. the the town, as well as specifically trying to do some improvements on Southeast Street uh, by by the school. Thanks, Bob. And I I, I want to note that so far the gist of the conversation that I'm hearing from the council is trying to reduce the number of roundabouts on Southeast Street. But we're again, like Bob said, early on in the process, and so we're working with the DPW and the engineers to see what can be done. One important aspect of that, um, the adjustments on that road. I'm going to say no matter what, but I'll die on this hill, is that um, mixed use paths would be put in next to the um, uh, next to the road so that folks could walk and bike to the school uh, along that road without having to go through the roundabouts, um, which ad advanced cyclists may be uh, adept at, but especially kiddos may not want to do. So um, that's part of that conversation as well. Uh, yeah, we're we're going to go, we're, we're working to make that safer for kids. Definitely. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to Martha and then, uh, we're going to probably end it at, at, at that point. So Martha, last comment for us. <laughs> okay. Well, you mentioned those four roundabouts <laughs> for that one block of Southeast street. And if there was ever a way to fritter away money from our town and its strapped budget and the schools that desperately need it, there is a wonderful example. It's something that we absolutely do not need. It does not increase safety. I ask any of you how many times you have tried to walk around the Triangle Street um, roundabout at rush hour and now you know try doing it at five o'clock when all the university is getting out then try doing it with two lively kids then put on your blindfold and let a guide dog try to do it their roundabouts are the absolutely most dangerous things for pedestrians and particularly children and to try to fix quote fix some problem of traffic by spending an absurd amount of money that ought to be going to either fixing roads or to helping our actual schools 
is just crazy. And even saying, oh, well, we'll only do two roundabout instead of four is still crazy. Uh, there needs to be some really careful, thoughtful work done by the uh, by your committee, Andy and Bob, and by the rest of our community, including parents and so on, of coming up with some way to make that strip a lot safer for children and for bicycles. And that's not to put in expensive roundabouts. And I know, Andy, you had mentioned that a lot of the traffic, particularly in the morning, is, is traffic going to UMass. You know, they try to take that shortcut through uh, Southeast Street. And so that means that just adding, you know, doubling the number of school uh, cars coming in when you have the new elementary school does not double the total amount of traffic at all, <laughs> it's mainly the university traffic. And so again, we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't necessarily exist. So I ask members of the council and members of the public, first walk around Triangle Street at 5 p.m. And then please try to think of some modest proposals that are not expensive that would help our children's safety, make it safe for bicycles and, and so on. So there's my speech. Uh, <laughs> so, Thank you, Martha. Okay. Thank you, Martha. I, I do wanna fact check one thing. There's significant data that shows that roundabouts are safer for pedestrians, drivers, and Martha, there's the, we can look at the data together and have this conversation another time if you'd like, but that data is out there um, that, that shows that roundabouts are safer than traditional stoplight intersections for those populations. And like I said before, that is one of the really important reasons why that mixed use path is there. But this is absolutely an ongoing conversation uh, in committee right now. Andy, go ahead, but please keep yeah, it short. I, hey, You're 40 minutes short. Over. Um, I just want to um, invite people to think about the problem, but the pro but to recognize what the problem is. Uh, there was lots of good reasons to choose the current Fort River site for the elementary school, and I don't have to go into what they all are. I think everybody knows what the good reasons were for doing it. But the one thing that um, is a problem is the way the traffic gets in and out of the school and the way that it is now uh, being designed by the architect who's working with the elementary school building committee. So the school buses come in what used to be the entrance and cars now come in um, and go out from what used to be the exit. And the exit is very close to Main Street. So that if you start thinking about the number of cars that want to turn left into the um, driveway to go in school in the morning, or in the afternoon to pick up their kids. And uh, they're, they're coming from that side. Um, and how quickly cars are gonna back up uh, beyond that intersection with Main Street, you got a problem. And so uh, I invite um, everybody to just help us be creative. And uh, if you have ideas, uh, <laughs> put them to Bob and me our emails are available on the uh, town website, and it's pretty obvious because uh, it's last name, first initial at amherstma.gov. So thank thanks. thanks, everybody. Um, our next district meeting is December 1st at 10 a.m. We will be sending out uh, notice of that via email as we get closer, but I want to just make sure folks have that now. December 1st at 10 a.m. It will also be on Zoom. We found more people can join. Um, folks can hear updates and still go about their day if they don't want to be on camera. Um, so this will be the, the mode that we go with for December as well. And we can, uh, if folks really would like us to meet in person at some point, please let us know and we can talk about that. I will say that in the past, um, when we've done in-person meetings, it, we've had much, much lower um, attendance because it's really hard to find a time where everyone can leave and come sit down with us for, for an hour and a half. So um, December 1st, 10 a.m. And yes, please reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to us individually via email 
or you can reach to, out to the entire council at town council at Amherst, oh my God, I'm sorry, at amherstma.gov. I work at Amherst College, so I almost keep going right to the other email ender, but it's amherstma.gov. Um, and yeah, reach out to us at any point. Um, I will say that uh, my disclaimer is please reach out to me multiple times if I haven't emailed you back. Um, I work a full-time job and do count town council on top of that. So please uh, just know that I'm I'm reading your emails and we'll always try to respond as much as quickly as possible if you request a response. With that, I'm going to let everyone go back to their Tuesdays. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, and we will see you either at a council meeting or at our next district meeting or just around town. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, everyone.